There are those things that happen in life that come upon you that sobers you for that moment in life. Let me explain what I mean by that. I want you to imagine with me that you are in your car on Indian Nations Turnpike in the dead of winter. And it's one of those dark nights out there. You can't see any stars. You can't see the moon. And there's no cars around you. It's just you and the pavement and your thoughts. But as you're driving on that time, that out of nowhere, everything lights up around you, and you discover that a state trooper is pulling you over. I'm telling you, in those moments, man, it'll sober you up. It'll, it'll cause you to come to attention very quickly at that time. <clears throat> Another example, I was, I was thinking, what does it mean to be sober? Imagine again, it's wintertime, and you're driving. And as you're driving, you come across a bridge, and as you do, you hit what is known as black ice. Have you done that? And your car begins to turn on that ice, and you realize that you're out of control. And in those seconds, you begin to pray and ask for the Lord's guidance and help. And as you come across that bridge, and it and it kind of whips back in the right lane, man, you are sober at that time. Man, your adrenaline is running. Another illustration of what I'm talking about, uh, be sober. Imagine you're sitting at a table, and all of a sudden you notice the chandelier above you begins to sway, and the table begins to vibrate, and you see stuff falling off the walls around you, and you realize, man, I'm in the midst of an earthquake right now. That is a sobering moment that happens. But I want you to know there is a day that is in your future that is coming. It's a day like no other day that you've ever experienced in your life. And it is a day that is destined for you. And it is a day that will cause you to walk soberly. I want you to turn in your Bibles with me, if you would, to Revelations chapter 22. And we're going to look at verse 12 and 13. We've been looking over the past several weeks, what are we to do as we wait for the Lord to come back for the church? What is it that we are to be about in our lives that we are to do? And we find it describes for us in this passage the very thing that we are to do. In Revelation 22, beginning in verse 12, reading through verse 13, Jesus speaks and he said, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. Listen, he said, I am the Alpha, I am the beginning, I am the Omega, I am the end, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And I will assure you, on that day, that you hear the trumpet of God, And the voice of the archangel, and you see Christ ascending from heaven, coming for the church, that will be a day that will cause you to be sober in your spirit. But as you and I wait for that day, we ought to walk every day of our lives soberly, keeping in mind that today could be that very day in which Christ comes back. Notice what he said in our passage. There's a day of judgment that is coming. A day of judgment for every man, every woman, every young person. A day of judgment. There will be a day of judgment for believers. A day of judgment for those that <coughs> excuse me, have rejected Christ. But the day of judgment is coming. It's on the calendar for every one of us. And the Lord has that day marked out for you and has it marked out for me. And that ought to cause you to live this life with a sober spirit, that you ought to be sober about knowing that Christ is coming again. 
But notice what Jesus said in that passage. He said, behold, I'm coming quickly. The word is not so much a reference in time, but the suddenness of his coming. That the suddenness of his coming. That today we are here in church and in a few moments we'll be leaving. And when he comes, it will be sudden. It will be quickly when he comes. And, it, and we will instantly know that, that Christ is coming. But the call for every believer is this. We've got to be ready. We need to be ready for that day that is coming. It's a day of judgment. I want you to know that the Bible speaks many places about the day of judgment. There's a day of judgment for Israel, as recorded in Ezekiel chapter 20. There's a day of judgment for the nations, as recorded in Matthew 25. There's a judgment of demons in Jude 6. There's the judgment of the great white throne in Revelation chapter 20. There's the judgment of sin that occurred on the cross. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 and 9 describes that. But particularly we're looking at today, there is a judgment for believers. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 through 17, that describes this judgment that's going to come for believers' lives. And as that judgment comes, as I said, we ought to find ourselves living in a way that we're ready for that judgment. That we find ourselves knowing that and believing that that judgment day could be today when Christ comes for the church, what we call the time of the rapture. And so in the time that we have left, I want us to see what's going to happen when Christ comes back and why we ought to live soberly during that time that we wait. So in your Bibles, I want you to look at the judgment of believers. The judgment of believers. You'll find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I want you to read with me in verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. Notice what it says. According to the grace of God, which is given to me, like a wise master builder, I lay a foundation, and another is building upon it. But each man must be careful, notice the word, be careful how he builds upon it. Paul was in Corinth for 18 months. And in those 18 months, Paul was laying a foundation for the church to build upon. And what Paul was laying as the foundation for the church to build upon, he was laying the gospel of Jesus Christ. What Paul was doing is what we are doing this morning. Paul was preaching God's word. And he was laying that foundation day by day, the Lord's day by day, Sunday day by day, he was laying that foundation because he said somebody else is going to come along and build upon this foundation. Well, we know that Timothy came, others came behind him, and they built upon this foundation. But we find that we see in verse 11, Paul talks about really there's only one foundation, and that foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. And everything that we do in our lives as believers ought to be built upon that foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. To bring him honor, to bring him glory, to serve him, we build upon that. But I want you to notice in verse 13, it tells us that every man's work is going to be tested by fire. And what Paul is saying on that day in which Christ returns for the church, there's a day that's going to be set in which we face the judgment of Christ. And I want you to notice three things about the judgment of Christ that you need to know. You ought to write these down. Three things about the judgment of Christ. The first thing we see, the summons. We see the summons. We're living in the church age. From the time that Christ died and rose again to the time that Christ comes back for the church, it's called the church age. 
We've been living in that church age for approximately about 2,000 years right now. And at the judgment that we find here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is going to be a judgment for those that live in the church age. It will be a judgment that we will stand before the Lord. Three places in the New Testament that we find that specifically speaks of this judgment that will occur of those believers that live during the church age. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. It's also found in Romans 14, 12, but it's found here in our text in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 through 17. And don't think for a moment that this judgment is for somebody else. You know, this, this judgment is for my Sunday school teacher. That's who this judgment is for. Or that my neighbor, oh, my neighbor, that, that's who God is going to judge at this time. Listen, my friend, don't, don't think this judgment is for somebody else. You need to get it in your mind that this judgment is for me. That you are going to have to stand before the Lord. This morning in our Sunday school class, we read the early parts of Revelation chapter 1. It gives an uh, unbelievable description of who Jesus is. They describe what he looks like. And can you imagine that you're going to have to stand alone, no props, no helps, no notes, just you and the Lord at the day of judgment. And you're going to be summoned, not somebody else. You are going to have to stand before the Lord. Well, how will it work? Well, maybe your name will be called. And they'll say, Fred, Janice, Bob. And he'll call your name. And you'll come before the throne of the Lord, just you and him. Or maybe you'll be transported and you'll be for the throne. But however it works and however it takes place, believe me, the Bible says there's a day waiting for you and Christ where you will appear before him in a time of judgment. And knowing that very fact, my friend, it ought to cause us in these times, in these days in which we wait for the Lord to return, it ought to cause us to walk in a sober spirit, in a, in a mind that's serious about our faith in Christ. Not, not a flippant attitude about church and, and about reading the Word and about um, being serious before the Lord that it ought to sober us to know that I'm going to have to stand before the Lord one day. That judgment seat, it's called the Bema. The Bema seat. It's where in Roman rule, it would be the word expression for the courtroom, the judiciary place. But it is also a term that is used in athle athletics. In the Roman time, in the Greek time, when somebody won an athletic event, they would come and stand before the Bema seat. And it was at the Bema seat that they would be rewarded, that they would receive the reward. And that's what this judgment is all about, that we're going to be summons together. And Christ is going to give us the rewards for what we have done with him. I want you to remind you again, that this is a judgment for believers. This is not a judgment that determines whether you're in heaven or out of heaven. That judgment happened at the cross, amen? That was settled at the cross. And so this judgment, it's not whether you get into heaven, that's already been determined. It's for every believer that lived in the church age. They will come to this judgment. And Christ says three times in Revelation chapter 22, behold, I'm coming. I'm coming quickly. I'm coming back again. And he gives us this word that Christ is coming back to summons us to a time of judgment. What would it look like? What will happen in this judgment? We find that your life will be tested. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, tested by fire. It'll expose what you did. It'll be seen. Second, You'll be rewarded for what you have done 
for the name of Christ. And every believer will appear before the judgment seat, the bema seat of Christ. And believe me, it's marked out in history. Your name is on it, and you will stand before Christ one day. But not only do we see the summons, but we see the scrutiny. I want you to understand that you're going to see the scrutiny. At the beamy seat, you'll stand before the Lord, and he will look deeply into your life. You know, I can hide a lot of things from you. I can hide a lot of things, uh, my emotions or my true feelings from you. On a good day, and that's going to be a real good day, I can even hide some things from Deanne. Because she used to what you doing? You know, she kind of knows. What are you doing? And I don't do very well. But on this day, my friend, I want you to know there is nothing hidden from the Lord. And when Christ scrutinizes your life, here's what he's going to look to. First of all, he's going to look at your motives. He's going to look at your motives. Why did you do the things that you did? Was it to look good? Was it to get your name out there? Was it uh, that you did it in order that you might not get in trouble or meet expectations? Or did you do it for the love of Christ? The love for your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Why did you do it? He's going to test your motives. But second, he's going to test your actions. What didn't you do? The things that I've commanded you to do. Why did you do the things that I've asked you not to do? You're going to be judged by your motives, by your actions, and third, by the opportunities. I, I'm telling you, there's some believers in India today that don't have the opportunities that you and I have to come to a, a phenomenal worship service like this, to sit here in air conditioners, to have a Bible available to every person that walks in, to be able to have an opportunity to know and get deep in the Word. So we're going to be held higher accountable than some of the believers in India that have little opportunity to the gospel and little opportunity to under really to go deep in the Word of God. And so we're going to held in a much greater fashion. And so the opportunities that God has given you, you had a neighbor next door and you never shared. You had friends that you worked with for 10 to 20 30 years, you never once invited them to a friend day to hear the gospel of Christ. And so it's going to be your motives. It's going to be your actions. It's going to be the opportunities that you're going to be judged on. And, and he's going to scrutinize you and look deeply. Man, excuses of why we didn't do what we should have done, man, they'll be wiped away because Christ will be judging us. Notice in verse 12, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says that we build upon the foundation, and the foundation of Christ. And so our lives, once we come to Christ, once we received him in that crusade, in our home, vacation Bible school, from that moment on, listen, we build upon him. But the question is, what are we building upon? What are we laying upon that foundation of Christ? And we find it all boils down to this. What are you doing with the knowledge of Christ that you have right now? What are you doing with him? That's what you're going to be scrutinized upon what you did with Christ. And that's what you're going to find yourself judged on. Now, you're not going to be judged by what uh, Godwin did or didn't do. You're not going to be judged about what the deacon in the church did or your Sunday school teacher. No, what did you do with the foundation of Christ, with the knowledge you have, with your motives that you had? What did you do? I want you to notice in our text, it divides the rewards or the lack of rewards in two different categories. Notice it says, the first category, are the rewards that, that 
you're going to be judged upon of the things that you laid on the foundation of Christ. Notice it says gold, the most precious thing, and that's silver, and then precious stones. What does it mean, gold and silver and precious stones? These are the things that we did with the knowledge of Christ. Serving, witnessing, doing things with the right motives, using our time right, being faithful, listen, with the resources that, that Christ has given us, not being selfish with them. That is gold, silver, precious stones that we lay on the foundation of Christ. But notice, there's a second category. It's a category of those that had impure motives, that their actions were wrong, and they didn't take the opportunities that Christ has given them. And he calls it what? Wood, hay, straw. Light a match to any of those. Wood, hay, straw, what do you have? Man, you have a roaring fire. And at that time in which Christ is scrutinizing your life, it says it's going to be tested with fire. It's going to be tested with fire. And those things that are not of, of the purest motives and the right actions, uh, they're going to be burned up. But the things that you did was right with gold, silver, and precious stone, those things, they are going to remain. I want you to notice verse 13, what it says. Each man's work will be evident. For that day will show it because it will be revealed by fire, and fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. And then notice verse 14. It tells us that we will receive a reward, a stephanos, a crown for those things in our lives that remain. After the scrutiny of Christ, those things that will continue to be there in our lives. And the Bible tells us that he's going to give out the rewards for us on that day. And I'm telling you, listen to me, on that day, you'll want a reward. You don't want to sit there before Christ on that day and just sit there. And that you did nothing with your life. You did nothing to bring him honor, nothing to serve him, nothing to bring him glory. You don't want to be there that day without a crown. Five crowns that the Bible mentions. I believe this is not an exhaustive list. I believe that there's more. But the Bible mentions five. Let me give those to you. The first one is the crown of righteousness. And that's given to those that love and are looking for the Lord's return. Many of you maybe heard the name of Don Demeter, professional baseball player. Grew up in Oklahoma City. He's actually a pastor in a church there. His son was a dear friend of Dean and I. He played, uh, was drafted by the Yankees. Don told a story one time about one of the kind of field managers that worked to prepare the field, the grass for the team. He saw him one day, and Don asked him, he said, man, you look kind of down today. What's wrong? He said, man, the Lord didn't come back today. He said, man, I, I was thinking the Lord coming back today. For somebody that with that attitude, this crown, the crown of righteousness is for them. And then there's a the crown of life for those who die for their faith in Christ. I remember talking to God when several years ago, he called me and he said, brother, I want you to pray. He said, man, there's a persecution of the church. He said, man, they're, they're burning believers in their homes, blocking them for they can't get out. They're catching believers while they're in the church, setting them on fire, and they have gone out, those who have lived out into the jungle. And Godwin said, I, I met him out in the jungle. And I said, Godwin, what did you say to those poor believers? Godwin said this, you've got to go back to your communities. It doesn't matter whether you live or die. Your community still needs to hear about Christ. And for those that give their lives in a martyr's death, 
from the name of Christ, they will receive that crown of life. The third crown that the Bible mentions is the incorruptible crown. It's a crown for the faithful uh, shepherds. Uh, excuse me, the incorruptible crown is for those that are faithful to the gospel. Uh, they, they, they're just faithful uh, to the Lord, but the crown of glory is for the faithful shepherds. And then the crown of rejoicing will be for the soul winners. Those who want to see souls come to Christ and, and they are busy soul winning. If you believe, listen to me, then Revelation chapter 24, that the 24 elders represent the church. Here's what we're going to do with our crowns. We're going to take our crowns off our heads and we're going to lay them at the feet of Jesus. And we're going to say, no, you're the one that is worthy. You're the one that is worthy. You're the one that is to be rewarded today, not me. And I'm telling you, you don't want to be there without something to lay at the feet of Jesus. So what that day is going to be like, there's going to be a day of summonings for everyone that's a believer. There's going to be a day of scrutiny. But for some on that day, listen to me, it's going to be a day of of sorrow some might disagree some of you say I, I want to picture that when I get to heaven man it's just going to be great it's just going to be perfect but I'm telling you on this day there's going to be a day of sorrow for many that will be there on that day why look with me in verse 15 if any man's work is burned up he will suffer loss but he himself shall be saved, yet as so through fire. Listen to me. I don't believe that you're going to stand there on that day and say, man, I'm so excited. Man, I, I made it to heaven, Lord, but I didn't have anything that I did for you to bring you honor and glory. Man, I got here by the skin of my teeth. Man, what a great day that is. I don't think so. When you see the Lord in all of his glory, in all of his majesty, and you come empty-handed on that day, I believe that there's going to be great cries and great sorrow on that day. It is interesting, just this week, I happened to turn on the radio, and Charles Stanley was preaching, and he said, uh, according to this verse, he said, folks, I'm telling you, there's going to be a day of great sorrow, a day of great weeping. And man, I was sitting there like, preach it, brother, because I believe that is true. I believe that is true. Remember, this is not a judgment for salvation, but it's a judgment for rewards. And I can't imagine standing before the King of kings and the Lord of lords saying, saved, yet by fire, and I have nothing that I did that laid upon your foundation. I've read an article that I wanted to share with you. Not only will some of our foundations that we lay will be burned up that are not of the Lord, some of them will be taken away. Listen, you might lay some gold down, you might lay silver down, you might lay some precious stones down, but those rewards can be removed from you. Randy Alcorn gave six specific examples where your rewards can be removed from you. I'm going to go through these quickly. So if you want to write them down, you need to write them very quickly. Here they are. The first one is this. We can forfeit rewards from God by seeking them from men. We can forfeit rewards from God by seeking them from man. Matthew 6, 5 through 6. What it's saying is that we just sought to please men all the time. We put men above pleasing God. And we want a reward from men. Man, that's a good reward. It's only temporal. But the reward that you want is a reward that lasts forever. It's a reward that God... And so, you know what? When you begin to seek man more than the praise of God, God says, you know what? You can lose some of your rewards. Second, we can have rewards taken from us because of unfaithfulness. Matthew chapter 25, 28 through verse 29, we find that some were taken because they were not 
being faithful to what God has called them to do. Thirdly, we can become disqualified from rewards because of immoral and spiritual compromise. Listen to me. Moral and spiritual compromise will remove some of the rewards that you already have laid. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27. Number four, we can lose rewards because of unproductive life. And that's what we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. Number five, we can lose rewards because of carelessness and waste. 2 John 2, 8. Number six, we can have our rewards taken up from us because of lack of attention to an obedient life, Revelation 3, 11. And so we find on that day that we're going to stand before the Lord and there's some that are going to be there with great sorrow and crying. Why, why does the Bible say this? That he's going to wipe every tear from their eye. Because we went crying to heaven? No, because we see Christ and we see that we so wasted our life and so live half-heartedly, not in passion and, and excitement with the Lord. I love the words of David, David Jeremiah, and he echoes this. And listen to what he says, and I quote. He said, in my opinion, we have declawed the judgment of believers. The judgment seat of Christ is a very frightening thing for me to think about. To stand before the Lion of Judah and have his gaze penetrate the innermost parts of my heart, my mind, is, is not something that I will anticipate if I have not been living my life for him. Yes, you're saved, but you have nothing to show the Lord. Write this verse down. 1 John 2, 28 says this. Now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence, and listen to this, not shriek away from him in shame at his coming. The word shriek means to be afraid. There'll be some on that day, they'll shriek away. Man, I've got to stand before the Lord. Man, I know that I haven't lived right. I know I've been careless in my life. I haven't studied the Word of God. I haven't been in prayer in my life. I haven't been witnessing and giving and tithing in my life. I haven't lived for the Lord. I haven't placed Him first. And you know what those people will do? The Bible said, man, they'll shriek away. And they'll shriek away from the Lord. They'll have great sorrows in their life. Why? They've wasted their time and wasted their lives. Listen to me. You're writing right now what that day will look like. You're writing right now what that day will look like. Will it be a day of rejoicing for you? A day of excitement for you? Or will it be a day of sorrow. You hold the pen in your hand and you're writing exactly what that day will look like when you stand before the Bema judgment seat of Christ. Make it a day of excitement. Make it a day of great joy by walking in a soberly life before Him. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, Father, we know that day is coming, that we're going to be summoned. And we know that your eyes can see the motives and the actions and the opportunities and that you're going to scrutinize our lives. And for some believers, even may for some here this morning, in the attic, in the main floor, it's going to be a day of great sorrow. We will shriek away 
will be afraid because we'll know at that moment I really didn't lay on the foundation of Christ the purest motives, the purest action, the purest service. And so, Father, we pray with that pen that we have in our hand of our life that we will prepare for that day today. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.